Oh, well, good morning. Okay, we're going to try that again. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate the effort there. Hey, good morning, everybody. It is so good to, to see you. I hope you had a great time in Sunday school. Hey, kid, why are you covering your ears? I'm not being that loud. Lynn, do something with that kid. He's being rude. Um, it is good to be with you today. Uh, there's no doubt that the rain had scared some folks off. I, I will say this. Maybe you've heard this, and this is unfair. You know, well, in other countries, when it rains, people still go to church. Have, has anybody, any pastor ever tried to guilt trip you, you know, by saying that? Let me tell you something. They're lying. I've been to several other countries, and when it rains, they don't go to church. Sometimes they cancel, but we don't cancel because your staff, we need to get paid. Um, uh, <laughs> That's low down. That's just Rusty gave me that line. It wasn't good. Um, speaking of Rusty, this is his second week with us. Uh, Rusty, do you have the stand up and let everybody see that beautiful jacket that you have on? Um, if you don't know, okay, that's enough, Rusty. Um, if you don't know, uh, Jer, it looks better on him. How dare you? How dare you? So the the running joke is um, our our good friend and and former youth minister, uh, minister of music uh, he wore a red jacket and it, it was always full of the holy spirit right it was the jacket not the man and um and so i stole it he still doesn't have it and uh, and so rusty was making fun of me about it this week and i said you know rusty i bet you have one of those jackets and he wore it the next day <laughs> and there's something about these music uh, ministers that have no sense of fashion but um Anyways, thanks, Rusty, for, uh, for wearing the jacket. You look almost as good as I do uh, in that jacket uh, last week. Well, it is good to, to be with you. If you're visiting with us, um, just forget everything that just happened. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are typically more professional here. As soon as I get off the stage, we know what we're doing. <laughs> Whoever said amen, you're going to get sick today after lunch. Well... We are glad that you're with us. Uh, we at First Baptist Church, we, we love the Lord. We depend on uh, just God's goodness in every step of the way. And I believe you'll be blessed today. Um, we, we are so thankful for you uh, being with us. We actually are, are observing uh, baptism this morning. And I say actually, we, we baptize a lot of folks throughout the year, but now uh, most people wait till the summer because we always do big lake baptisms. And so we, we don't pull out our... our um, our movable baptistry that often anymore, but we do have two uh, young kids that are going to be baptized because they're sadly moving away soon. And they said, before we move, we want to be baptized in this church that we love. And so we're excited about doing that. But before we do, just want to cover a few announcements uh, and basically two simple announcements. Tonight, we're having a big movie night. We're showing this movie, The Insanity of God. Um, we've been talking about it a lot over the last couple of weeks. It's about a missionary who served uh, over in Africa for several years in a very, very hard and dark uh, environment and uh, experienced personal tragedy. And when he came back to the States for, for some rest and recovery, he really wrestled with God about does this whole relationship with Jesus, is it, does it only work in America or can it work elsewhere? Do you have to have health and wealth to really trust Jesus? And so it's a great movie. Uh, we're showing it tonight at 5 o'clock. We typically meet at 6. We're showing it tonight at 5 o'clock. It's about an hour and a half, two hours. And um, it's uh, so tonight at 5. If you can't make it, uh, you can rent this movie from me for $10 a day. And, uh, and that, that will go to the ministry of my family. Um, and then, uh, and then next Sunday night is our annual church picnic, and this is a, a big event that we do every year. We have several hundred people out there. We, we have kickball. We do a big egg toss. Uh, the church will provide the drinks and the meat and the fixings, you know, stuff to put on the, the, the burgers. Uh, we just ask you to provide the sides, and so, um, so we hope that you'll join us next uh, Sunday night, and we, we are believing in the name of Jesus Christ that the rain will be gone, and, uh, but we shall see. Um, so that's next week. And I believe that is all the announcements. Am I missing anything, Matt? Can you think of anything? We're good. All right. Well, I'm going to have uh, read a scripture, and then we're going to pray and enter right into time of baptism. This morning, we're going to sing a song, Blessed Be Your Name. And Job um, talked about that. He experienced all kinds of tragedies in about a, a day or two, and he lost all that he had, family, land, property. And he says, at this, Job got up, and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. 
May the name of the Lord be praised. I don't know where you are today, good spot or bad spot with the Lord, but I pray that you came today to be prepared to worship God because he loves you and he's with you no matter where you are, okay? Let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. I'm so thankful for uh, the family and friends that are here today. You truly bless us each time we come together, and, and I'm thankful. I'm thankful that there is such joy, and I'm thankful that we have a spirit that, uh, of expectancy that you're going to meet us here. And Lord, we, we ask that the Holy Spirit will stir up our hearts. We ask the Holy Spirit to draw us near to you. And Lord, I pray that that will start right now through the baptism of these precious children. Lord, we dedicate this time to you, and I pray that you'll be well pleased. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. We have baptism today. We don't have baptisms very often inside because so often we go outside. But this family, uh, this is Brandon uh, uh, Fisher. Yeah, Brandon Fisher and his, his sister are going to be baptized today. They're going to be moving. And so I wanted to head and follow the Lord in baptism. I think this is just a beautiful picture to see with Mom Garnett here, what God has done in their life and the ministry of this church to them. But this is Brandon. He has received Christ as his Lord and Savior. Brandon, does this baptism mean that you want the rest of your life to count for Jesus? Yes, I do. It's good. It's my privilege to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hold your nose. As Jesus was speaking to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, he says, The time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Praise the Lord for uh, these being baptized today, and uh, we need to pray with them and for them as they uh, begin this walk in Christ, that they will grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. It's great to be back with you today. My wife Susan is also here. Wave your hand for a minute. And uh, she was sick last Sunday, so I'm so glad that uh, she's here uh, today with us to uh, worship with us. And uh, thank you so much, Brother Cliff, for sharing that, uh, that scripture with us. Uh, Psalm 46.1 says that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. That means he is present. He is with us to help us. Good times, bad times, we can praise him and we can bless him and give him honor and glory. So we want to do that today. Let me invite you to stand as we sing together. Blessed be your name.
you say praise the Lord? Praise, praise the, Lord. the Lord for his great love for us. You may be seated. The choir is going to share a song. And the reason we can sing, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord, is because of what Jesus has done for us. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He took all of our sins upon him. So worship with us uh, as the choir sings where the nails were.
a thought. Jesus paid it all. Praise his name. And we can sing this next song because of what Jesus has done for us. Most of you probably know the story about Horatio Spafford, the author of this hymn, and how he tragically lost four daughters at sea. And yet, even in the midst of that, he wrote these words because he had such a relationship with Jesus and knew God was in control. He said, it is well with my soul. So my question is, how's your soul today? Is it well with your soul because you're rightly related to Jesus Christ? Let me invite you to stand as we sing together. It is well with my soul. Let's pray. 
Gracious and Heavenly Father, we come to you with a stained background, Lord, and only you can cleanse that background. Only you can cleanse our hearts, Lord. So we ask that you cleanse our hearts today, that you bless Brother Chuck as he, as he delivers our sermon, Lord, speak through him and allow us to take it and apply it to our lives and grow closer to you. Lord, we give you praise for all that you've done. You're working in, in so many different ways here at our church, and we, we are grateful for a church that is a pillar within our community. We thank you for the leaders that you've brought to us, Lord. Lord, we, we come to you today and we ask that you bless this offering that we're about to receive, Lord, and that it glorify you. Lord, we give you praise, and we ask that we have an unwavering focus on you today and as we continue to move forward. It's in your gracious, holy, and heavenly name. Amen. When I wake from my sleep, I know your angels have been watching over me, and I give thanks to you. Thank you, folks, so much. Those of you that brave the stormy weather, aren't you glad you came to hear that? Amen. Great. Thank you. We're, uh, we're so blessed. The choir did such a beautiful job, Kathy, and the choir, wonderful. And then uh, Beth Jones. Way to go, Beth. We are in New Holly, but uh, Beth was a big surprise. And then Rusty on the banjo. Now, what you don't know, I mean, th that was great. Woo, yeah, R Rusty. But next week, he's going to play the tuba. He's going to pole vault over the banister with the tuba. 
it's going to be, it's going to be big league. It's going to be big league. I'm telling you right now. Thank you, guys. All right, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, let's uh, open our Bibles now. You've got the screen up there for us. The Power to Live, Be Set Free by the Power of Christ is the title of the series. And then we're going to look today, the title of the message is The Power to Live or Die. You, don't, you can't really live until you're ready to die. So today let's look at this wonderful passage of Scripture as we study where Paul is writing from and how he's dealing with the terrible conditions that he's in. And in the midst of awful conditions, he has the power to live and the power to die. Have you ever felt like just having a, just a giant pity party and inviting all your friends and relatives to it and realize that if you did, none of them would show up? Nobody wants to go to a pity party. There will be a few people that will come because they're like wanting to hold your hand and, and help you through it, but most people don't like the woe is me. If there's anybody that deserved to have a pity party, it was the Apostle Paul. My goodness, where was he? He was in a Roman cell. Now folks, it wasn't like being in, the, in a jail cell here in America. It was not a cell, it was a dungeon. The darkest and dreariest and the most awful circumstances you could imagine. That's where he was shackled in prison. That's where he had to spend years. And in the midst of that chaos, in the midst of all that pain and and torture, being chained to a wall, chained to a Roman guard, he had the power to live and the power to die. What a great power resided within him, may each one of us today, by the grace of God, walk out of here, not only hearing about it and reading about it, but may each one of us walk out of it with that same power alive within us. All right? You can know it here, but if you don't have it here, it's not going to do any good. Let's read this wonderful passage of Scripture. First, uh, first uh, Philippians, starting verse 12. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel. He, he said, the gospel is not going to be stopped. They thought they had stopped Paul preaching by putting him in a cell, but it had not stopped him, it had not stopped the gospel from going forward. He had been stopped but the gospel, do you know the gospel has never stopped? The gospel cannot be stopped. God's message is going to get out one way or the other. So this is what happened to Paul. So he said, it, it, it has become known. This is, he said, this is what's going on. They think they've stopped. But let me tell you what's really going on. Throughout uh, the whole imperial guard, it says praetorian guard in another translation, King James, and that would be like, the, the palace guards, the, the special forces, if you would, the elite soldiers that were around Caesar, the whole imperial guard to everyone else, that my imprisonment because I am in Christ. This is why I'm here. They're like, why is he here? He's, he's a Christian. Most of the brothers, it says, have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment, and they dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. Courage gives birth to courage in other people. When you become courageous, it's, it is, it is uh, something that goes to other people. Fear works the same way. When you become fearful, it becomes infectious in a negative way, and it spreads to other people. So he said, the courage of going into the prison brought courage to others. They were fearless. Now he said, some people have got the wrong motive. Some are preaching out of envy, some out of rivalry. You know, some people just are that way. But then he says, uh, my imprisonment, and they dare even more, uh, I'm sorry, go to the next one if you would, uh, but others out of goodwill. These preach out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. Some people like to think of themselves as preachers, and they, they say, you know, if I can get in front of a crowd, that's going to make me feel real good. So it's selfish ambition, but they're not sincere, thinking they will cause me trouble in my imprisonment. Can you imagine that Paul had people who didn't like him? You know, if, you're not, if you don't have some people that don't like you, if you're truly staying for Christ, you're going to have that. He said, but what does it matter? Only that in every way, for, whether from false motives or true motives, he said, I don't care. 
Here's what I do care. Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and will continue to rejoice because I know this will lead to my salvation through your prayers. And it doesn't mean he needs to get saved. It means his deliverance, whether it be through life or through death. It will lead to my salvation through your prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. My eager expectation hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now as always with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For me, he says, just for me now, doesn't matter. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Folks, listen, that is such a powerful statement. I want you to just say it with me out loud, okay? Verse 21, look on the screen, say it out loud in this version. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. D doesn't that just make you feel a little bit stronger? It should. Now, if I live on in the flesh, he said, so if I stay, this means fruitful work for me, and I don't know which one I should choose. I am torn between the two. I long to depart to be with you, but it's best that I not. Uh, which is far better. We're going to stop there and go to verse 24 later in the message. All right? What a great passage of Scripture. Verses 12 through 18 show us a couple of things. When it comes to having the power to live or die, that being a Christian means that there's going to be criticism and conflict. I mean, Paul had it. People, people were critical of him. They didn't like him. They thought he was too ambitious. They thought he was way... Uh, too strong in his preaching Christ. But he said, I don't let that stop me. Romans 8, 28 is a crucial verse when it comes to life and dealing with criticism and conflict. We know that all things work together for good of those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose. God is going to see to it that his message gets out no matter what the criticism is. No matter what the conflict is, no matter what the opposition is, he's going to see to it that the gospel is proclaimed. Nothing can hinder the work and the word of God. Look what it says in 2 Timothy 2 verse 9. He said, I'm suffering. I, I got to tell you, I'm suffering like a common criminal. I am bound and chained like a criminal. But the word of God, it is not bound, nor is it chained. When we go back in the earlier verses of Scripture at the beginning of the reading, you'll notice that he said the word is out in the imperial guard. Here's what is happening. Paul was in that prison and every four hours there would be, there, there, there would be a change of guard. There, there would be a guard right beside him for four hours and then there would be a chain of guard, a, chain of, uh, a change of guard, I mean. So there was Paul. What do you think Paul was doing? He wasn't talking to him necessarily about the weather. How is it upstairs? How is there out there in the sunlight? He was talking to him about the most important person in his life, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. And either, he, either the guard would listen or either the guard would slap him and tell him to shut up, but I'm sure after a while Paul would sneak in a word of witness again to the guard. So what happened in result of that was some of those guards were getting saved. And they were going outside the dungeon. They were going upstairs. They were going into the hallways of Caesar's palace and said, you're not going to believe. You're not going to believe. You are not going to believe. This fellow that's down there in this prison cell, he says there's a man named Jesus. It's a Jew that died on the cross and rose from the dead. I don't know whether or not I believe him, but he is the most amazing man, this person, Paul. He is the most amazing man that I've ever met. And... Many of them get saved. Well, what happens then? Paul starts discipling them, teaching them the ways of Christ. What happens to the gospel? It begins to filter out. It, begun, it goes into homes and families, and they too come to know Christ. Folks, listen, this is not my way of doing evangelism. Uh, in the natural thinking, in the natural world, how, how would you do evangelism? Well, let me tell you how we as most Baptist preachers would do it. We want to evangelize Rome. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to form a committee. Let's form a committee and let's raise some money and we're going to rent the Roman Colosseum. We're going to rent the Roman Colosseum and we're going to call in Chris Tomlin to sing. 
We're going to have Rick Warren, Franklin Graham. We're going to have uh, just all kinds of famous evangelists. Cliff, Cliff Marion will preach and uh, just a whole bunch of famous people will come to the Coliseum. We're going to pack it in. We're going to we're going to drop leaflets all over Rome and we're going to evangelize Rome and everybody's going to say, great idea. But what if we got together and said, let's evangelize Rome and let's pray and the Lord says, I want you to go to prison. And we said, okay, Lord, we'll go and preach in the prison. He said, no, I want you to go into the prison <laughs> and live in the prison. We'd say, oh, got another idea, God. <laughs> I don't know if I like that one. But you see, the Lord's ways are not our ways. There's this thing called alchemy. Alchemy is, and I'm no chemist, so please don't try and explain more than I don't know already, but uh, alchemy is something that took place about three or 400 years ago. It's when it first started, up until 100 years ago. Scientists, what they were doing was this. They were trying to turn common minerals into gold. It was felt that there, if there was enough scientific experiment that just as you could take coal and turn it into a diamond, you could take minerals and turn it into gold. And wouldn't it be great to have gold everywhere? And so for hundreds of years, people like Sir Isaac Newton worked on the process of alchemy, but they never could, of course, they never could get that done. That's something only God can do. But as a result of that, there were other discoveries that were made. On the physical side, it couldn't be done. But on the spiritual side, it is done. God can take the worst of circumstances and turn it into gospel gold. He can take it and, and use it in a great and mighty way. That's exactly what Paul was doing. That's what God was doing in Paul's life. Look here, in your circumstances, in your outline, make the choice to rejoice. When things get better, I'm going to start rejoicing. No. While they're bad, start rejoicing at what God is going to do. Now, you don't know what it is. Say, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I know you're doing, and I'm going to trust you. Instead of complaining about what God did not do, circumstances and criticism and conflict will come, but God is always going to be at work. The second thing that I want us to see is this. There's a winning proposition about the power to live and the power to die. Verses 19 through 22 are just some of the most powerful verses about the core and the crux of the Christian life. And in those verses, Paul said, everyone has to make a decision about Jesus, about how they're, what they're going to do with Jesus. You can't just kind of have him on the outside circumference of your life. He's got to be the very center. He's got to be the center point of gravity, the thing around, the one around which everything revolves. Look what it says in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. How is it? Christ died for me. I died with Christ. Christ was resurrected. I was resurrected as well. I live because Christ lives. I live also, and Christ lives within me. So there is not only the person of Christ who is raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of the Father, but there is the person of Christ who is dwelling within me. So therefore, His strength, His power is always there available. It all depends about on having the proper point of view. So as I've already stated, a man is never really ready to live until he's ready to die. Now here's what it was with the Apostle Paul. He was so consumed with Jesus. I mean, he ate Jesus, he drank Jesus, he talked about Jesus, he thought about Jesus. He never, he had never, ever gotten over the Damascus Road experience. He wanted everybody to know what he knew. He wanted everybody to love Jesus like he did. And he knew that when he saw a soul, that they were a candidate for the gospel. They were a candidate for eternal life to be given. And therefore, he said, there's another person that can come to the cross. There's another person that can come to know the Lord Jesus. If there was something better out there, Paul said, I'd be chasing it. If there was someone greater, I'd be studying him. If there was somebody that had more noble thoughts than, than that, I'd be looking unto him 
but I've looked the world over. He said, I am the most studious of students when it comes to the Old Testament. I'm also familiar with the writings of the Greek philosophers. And in all of that and much more, I can tell you I've never, ever come to experience what it is to come to know not only mentally but spiritually and emotionally the Lord Jesus Christ. For me to live, he said, is Christ. There is no other life than his. And folks, what Paul said then is true today. There is no other life. There is no other life outside of the Lord Jesus. You can chase a dream, and I can promise you if Christ is not the center of it, you will be sadly disappointed. You can work to build an empire, but if Christ is not on the throne, it will crumble and fail. You can search for, you know, the big, the big meaning in life, and you can scale the highest mountain, and sit at the feet of the biggest you know, guru that there is, and you will always come up short. You want to know why? Because there is no one. There is no one. There is no one who can love your soul like the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no one who can change your heart like the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no one who can give you a purpose in life People today are saying, well, I've got to find my way. I've got to find my purpose. I've got to find my meaning in life. Have you ever been out and noticed that when you want to find your way to go, and of course today we have GPS and it takes care of everything, but before we would always use landmarks to follow in order to get someone. Well, if you follow, if you go to that tree over there and turn right, then if you go a ways and turn left at that bush, you'll find out where you need to go. But today we have GPS, but Jesus is the landmark. He, is the, he said, follow me. You may say, Lord, I don't know where you're going. He said, don't need to go. You don't need to know. Oh, I just knew, wish I knew what Jesus was doing. Jesus knows what he's doing. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know everything. We all want to know everything. You don't need to know everything. You can't know. I can't know everything. He knows everything. Therefore, he knows the way to the truth because he is the truth. He knows the way to the life because he is the life. You say, but it seems so dark. I don't understand. That's because you're walking and thinking in darkness. And he said, I am the light of the world. He that believeth in me will never have darkness. He is, there is no one who can comfort my soul. No one. Listen, no one can comfort your heart and soul like Jesus. You can search for meaning. You can search for someone else. Well, you know, I'm just not getting the love that I need. And you know what? You're exactly right. Because that's because you're drinking from the wrong fountain. You're eating at the wrong table. You're sleeping in the wrong dreams out there. There's only one that can give you the comfort that your soul desperately searches for, and it's the Lord Jesus. He is the one who gives meaning in life. He is the one who gives nourishment. Right now, you feel so weak. You feel so empty. You feel so dry. You feel so barren. That's because He is the bread of life. And until you come to the bread of life, you're going to feel weak. You're going to feel barren. And you're going to feel empty. You may say, I, I, I just need something. I need something. And, and you're confessing that you're thirsty. And the reason why you're so thirsty is because you've been drinking from the wrong fountain. And Jesus said, I am the water of life. He that comes and drinks of me will never thirst again. He is everything that I could possibly want and need in life. And I'm telling you that that, I want to tell you something. Jesus does not owe me a thank you for one thing I've done for him. Everybody today wants a medal. Everybody today wants a thank you. He does not owe you or me a thank you. We are unprofitable servants. But he has chosen. He has chosen. He has chosen. He has chosen 
to manifest his love upon the most unworthy. He has chosen to give his, his love, his grace, his salvation to the most unworthy. I can receive a lot of, I can get presidential honors. I'll, I'll never get a presidential honor. <laughs> But I could receive a presidential honor. I could receive medals from kings and queens. I could receive citations and honorary degrees from universities and pretend ideas that would make me feel powerful. I want to tell you something. The greatest honor in my life is I'm a child of the king. That's the greatest honor that I've been saved by the magnificent and wonderful name of Christ. I have... If I'm taken from this world, I have lost nothing, but I've gained everything. Because of knowing Him, to know Him, for me to live, for me to live is nothing more than to live with Jesus every morning, every evening, all the time. That's a winning. You can't lose, friend. You cannot lose when you, when you live like that. Then it says to die is gain. You may say, Brother Chuck, that sounds morbid. Well, here's what we need to think about. Death. Death at the proper time is all that the Lord wants us to live. And say, Lord, I trust my times are in your hands. Death is like, a, it's like an exit. And you know, when you walk out an exit, you walk out into the greater. You see, if you notice that, when you walk out into an exit, you walk out into the greater. And this world and this life that we're living in right now, you know what it is? It's like a narrow hallway. And when we step, as Christians, when we step through the exit sign of death, we will be going out into the great, vast, and expanse that the Lord has for us. Do you think it's, it's a big world? It's small and tiny compared to what the Lord has in store for us so that we are opening our heart and lives. We are going to experience grandeur like we've never experienced before, greatness like has never Sing love like you cannot comprehend, and joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's why the Apostle Paul said, for me to die is gain. So, I, uh, so what we have to do is, as a Christian, we have to live and say, Lord, my time is in your hands. I give it all unto you. You know, one time there was a famous theologian. His mother had prayed him from his wild, uh, sinful days, had prayed him to salvation. He lived a glorious and wonderful Christian life. And um, one day he was going to go on a trip, and his elderly mother by now, her health had declined, but he said, Mom, I'm going to go on a trip. And she's, uh, she said, Son, I want to go with you. He said, Mom, you need to stay home. Your, health, your age and your health means that you should stay at home. And she said to him this. She said, Son... Don't you know that my life is hid with Christ in God? And as long as my life is hid with Christ in God, I am always at home. Always at home. A winning proposition for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Now, what's the reason? Why do we stay? Why do we stay? Well, why doesn't the Lord, when we give our hearts to Him, if He really loved us, why does He leave us in this cold, cruel world? Well, why don't we just go on to glory? Have you ever thought that and said that? Well, so that we can enjoy some good things here on the earth. I get what you're saying. But the good things on this earth are going to be so minor compared to the great things in heaven. You can't comprehend it. So why do we stay if God has so much greater in store for us? Man is a sinner. He needs Salvation. Therefore, we stay to advance the gospel. Look at verses 23 through 26 and see what it says here. He says, um, I am torn between the two. I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Since I am persuaded of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with all of you for your progress and join the faith so that because of my coming to you again, your boasting in Christ is uh, fulfilled. So that your boasting in Christ may abound. So the reason why we stay is, according to verses 23 and 26, through 26, is to advance the gospel. You've got an opportunity. You have an opportunity to be a witness for Christ. Just this past week, I had a 
I had an eight-year-old tell me, I'm so excited about telling my friends about Jesus. Had given her heart to Christ and wanted to let others know about what Christ done in her heart. I mean, out of the mouth of babes speaks great wisdom. Now, God has given you a great platform to share His Word, His good news with others. They are wanting to hear, is there any hope for my life? They're, they're needing to hear that there is more than the day-to-day -day drudgery that sin has to offer. They're, they're thirsting that for more than what this world is offering. Waking up in the morning for a lot of people means this. I have no purpose. I have no direction. I have so much guilt. I have so much hurt. I have so much abuse. I have so many self-inflicted wounds that I have put on my life. I don't know where and how I'm going to be able to get away from the demons that are chasing me. What do I do? And then comes the good news. Jesus paid it all. Everything has been placed upon Christ if you will come to Him just as you are. Not to remain as you are, but if you'll come to Him just as you are and kneel at the cross and receive the gift of salvation, you too, from the lowest of the low to the highest of the high, can be saved. That's why the Lord leaves us here, to advance the gospel. But sometimes we're selfish. Have you ever noticed that? We can be so selfish, even about spiritual things. And sometimes people will say this. Have you ever heard people say this? I just wish I could die. Oh, I, I, I'm just so upset I wish I could die. Now, when people, and I get what they're saying, but what are they really saying? I wish I could escape my problems. I, I don't want to deal with what I'm having to deal with. That was not the Apostle Paul. Paul wasn't saying, oh, I just wish I could die. I'm so tired of being these chains. He said, if it, if it means I need to stay, as long as it takes to see people saved, I'm all for it. So there wasn't any of this desire to go home to be with the Lord that came out of selfishness. It was a desire that the gospel be advanced. Now, which brings us to this point. When is it your time to die? You may say, when I get old? Well, maybe so. Maybe not. <laughs> because here's the truth. God's time is always the right time to head on into glory. You may say, oh, he left us too soon. Did he? Oh, she was too young was she his ways are not our ways it hurts on this side but in heaven's side there's rejoicing now let's just sum all this up let's sum it all up for me to live here's what the world says and let's get it right though for me to live is money that's what a lot of people say and when I die you know what's going to happen how much did he leave he's going to leave it all going to leave it all. By the way, Proverbs says that a wise man leaves. Hey, kids, you're going to like this, what I'm going to say. A wise man leaves an inheritance to his grandchildren. So during lunch, you tell your granddad, write me in the will. <laughs> I, I, that's the word of God now. What's well, the word of God? That's what it says. But then it also says a sinner's wealth is taken from him. Okay, sorry, getting on to another sermon. <laughs> For me to live is money. You're going to leave it all. It doesn't matter how little or how great it is. The world says for me to live is fame. <coughs> how many of you know the most famous person in the world? Rudolph Valentino. Oh, that was a hundred years ago. He was the most famous movie star in the whole world. You've never heard of him. Most of you. For me to live is fame, and to die is to be forgotten. To be forgotten. For me to live is power, and to die, it don't matter how powerful you are. You can be a mafia boss or the leader of an entire population. But when you die, it's going to all be lost. You're going to lose it all. But to live is Christ <laughs> means to gain everything. Are you ready to gain and quit losing? I pray today that you will. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, how great it is to know you and not have to fear death. Lord, none of us here
trying to speed up the process. At least nobody here is trying to speed up the process. But I pray, Father, that in the process we'll be ready. Pray that we'll be ready. If anyone is here, and Lord, there are some folks here that aren't ready to die. They need to gain salvation. And if you're here today without Christ, there's nothing else that you can gain in your life that will give you the security that Jesus Christ will. I, I, I ask you today to gain salvation, not so that you can be a better person. I ask you this so that you can be rescued from hell because right now that's the only thing you'll gain without Christ. Today, give your heart to Christ and trust Him today. Today, give your heart to Him and say, I'm a sinner and I want you as my Savior. Jesus, save me. Jesus, save me. Jesus, please save me. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Oh, I pray that you'll do that. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. God loved. God gave His only begotten Son. Thank you for being a part of our service today. I really hope the music and the message spoke to your heart. Whatever the Lord spoke to you about, you need to act upon it. Because if you don't, you're going to miss a real blessing. And when you act upon it, the Holy Spirit's going to have an opportunity to bring a new freshness in your life. If we can help in any way, please let us know. Until next time, may the Lord richly bless you.